Good morning. I've often told the story about, um, about when my second child was born. And I loved my first child so much that one of the biggest worries I had was, could I love this second one as much as I love the first one? And, and of course I discovered that that was not only possible, but completely natural. And that love is not something that's finite, if it's really love. Love is expansive and it builds on things, you know. It's a bit like, well, now worrying when you're enjoying a piece of cake with uh, around the table and spending all your time worrying about whether I'm going to be able to get that second piece of cake so that you don't enjoy the one you're having now. Thinking in terms of what we don't have rather than what we have been given. The love that, that's all around us can put us in a, in a place of, of poverty and loneliness. Today, with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus teaches us that even in the midst of the wilderness, there is the possibility of abundance. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we beseech you, let your continual pity cleanse and defend thy church, because it cannot continue in safety without your succor. Preserve it evermore by your help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 5. Thus says the Lord, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. 
Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, listen, so that you may live. I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. Psalm 145, verses 8 through 9, and then 15 through 22. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone, and his compassion is over all his works. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his works and loving in all his ways. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all who call upon him faithfully. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and helps them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but he destroys the wicked. My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and forever. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience, conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing ceasing anguish in my heart, for I could not wish that I, my, I could wish myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus withdrew to a deserted place by himself, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. 
They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week I was speaking to one of our parishioners who's a teacher. She can't wait to get back into the classroom, you know, despite all of the chaos and cautions and concerns that we have. But she wants to get back into the classroom, and I think probably pretty much for the same reasons we want to get back into church. Because it's hard to replicate personal nearness without physical presence. It's hard to replicate being close to someone without being in the presence of someone. And it is a critical thing for teaching as we talked, how important it is for that proximity to happen so, so that you can know them. <laughs> um, to know the students in all their vast array and even more critically, to care about knowing them. Students, after all, are not the, always that easy to know. Sometimes they do their best to evade being known. Some know it all. Some don't care. Some carry burdens that makes it hard to be a student. I probably fitted into each one of those categories uh, throughout my educational career, even the most recent one uh, ending this year with, a, with this postgraduate thing that I was doing. You know, it just struck me so how important it is that the most important quality of a teacher, of a good teacher, of the best teachers I have had, have not necessarily been their, their cerebral uh, capacity, but rather their compassionate capacity. Seeking to know me and desiring to know me well enough that they were able to deliver out of me something I didn't know I had or something I didn't think I was capable of doing or thinking or experiencing. Learning, after all, begins with a lack, begins with something missing, becomes a, uh, begins with an awareness of something missing begins in a sense with poverty and moves forward into a new world that has a sense of abundance, a sense of more. Jesus, as we read today, had compassion for the crowd that had gathered around him. That great word, compassion, that we see in various other parts of the readings today in one way or another. They were hungry, of course, yes. And, uh, and they were hungry for more than just food. There is a huge sense of poverty in the whole scene. It is the poverty of, of being hungry, yes, by the crowd, but it is also the poverty of the disciples themselves. The disciples themselves 
who see a problem that is absolutely impossible. They cannot get beyond the poverty of their own limited thinking. I think uh, um, about me sitting in my calculus class in college, not knowing what was going on. Terrifying. <laughs> where a lesser teacher would have probably just given up on me or just promoted me and got me out of the classroom and moved me on. But where a good teacher stuck with me and met with me outside of class and showed me something I couldn't have seen without his compassion. <laughs> a glimpse of the sheer beauty of what math is a glimpse of a whole world that I would have never have imagined before. Going back to that word, compassion, the Greek word itself is not a noun. Significantly, it's a verb. Compassion just doesn't sit there. It acts, it does things. And at least three things that I can think of today one is, it's all, and it's all about that movement. It's all about that verbal movement. First of all, it moves toward the person who's in front of us. Second movement is that it moves away from ourselves. And the third movement is kind of a, a, a movement of the conscious to the unconscious. So that the first two movements toward and away from become in, in a very inadequate way of expressing it, but natural. Natural. It becomes less of an effort and more of something that's coming out of a deep sense of who we are or are becoming. Compassion is what the Good Samaritan does when he sees the wounded man in the street, it's the same word. Compassion is what the father does. It's the same word when uh, the prodigal son, his prodigal son comes uh, sort of drooping back uh, in uh, despair and disgrace. Neither the Samaritan nor the father are worried about getting their hands dirty. They simply see pain. They see a need and they move toward it. The wounded man is lifted up and the disgraced son is embraced. The struggling kid in class finds encouragement. Jesus sees the crowd, has compassion towards them, and he directs action towards them. He challenges us. You give them something to eat. But we're in a wilderness. There's nothing here. They look at what they do not have. Jesus looks at what they do have. Two completely different ways of seeing the world. The disciples are led by Jesus through the grace of God out of their poverty thinking into a world of abundance thinking. And are led out at the same time out of their own self-obsession, their own fear. The focus on the other person leads them away from their focus on themselves and what they do not have. Jesus directs it even further. He prays. He points out that this is all from the God of love. That that is where all of this movement is coming from. The movement towards and away and from the head to the heart. Back to that word, that Greek word. It's both active, as I've said, but it's also bodily. 
it's not a mental notion. It is a word that actually means gut-wrenching. It is an, a kind of experience of discomfort, of pain and urgency in the body as a reflection of the pain and urgency which is being witnessed in front of them. It is an entering into, it is a stepping into another life with all of its foibles. And the way God steps into our life, the story that this story is all about, the story of what the church is all about, stepping of God stepping into our messes naturally towards us, away from God's self. And in that kind of all of that movement <laughs> towards a way and from head to heart there is abundance and there are leftovers. <laughs> That's the piece. The leftovers. Twelve baskets left over. That's what makes this story a miracle. It's the proof of the miracle that they hardly even noticed happening when it was going on. But there we have it. There's more besides. Which is especially striking in the wilderness. Or in a wilderness season where we don't seem to have the resources or the will. And we're tired and anxious and worried and conflicted in so many ways. But where there is so much more by God's grace, where there is nourishment of body and soul, if we moved from that poverty thinking into that abundance thinking. To begin each day with what we have and what we have been given in family and friends and yes and teachers, teachers of all kinds who have come in all shapes and sizes and instances and seasons in our life where there are plenty of leftovers to feed us. Leftovers that still shape us by their compassion, which deliver us even in the wilderness from lonely poverty into the abundant love we can find when in our compassion we allow the movement of God to take place. We may find that even the restrictions which are so tedious <laughs> and soul crushing on so many levels in the current season are nothing compared to the liberation of the same soul to a new world of love, a new world of love. It's what the prophets call us to, even in the midst of misery and degradation and, and, uh, uh, and emptiness and poverty. There is always a new world, a new world where we focus on what we have been given and have been given into and become part and parcel of a whole new world that we could never, ever have imagined. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now pray for the church and for the world. Who can separate us from the abundant love of God? Let, us, let our hearts now respond to such overwhelming love as we pray together in the spirit saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer that you, O oh Lord, will remind us of your bountiful promise to us, that it might continually inspire us in works of mercy. Lord, in your mercy. That the ministers of the gospel may be people of genuine conversion and prophetic voice. For all who minister as lay people and ordained, our own bishops, Rob Wright, Don Wimberly, and Paul Lambert, our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Lord, in your mercy. In the diocese, we pray especially today for the people and clergy of the Church of the Transfiguration, Rome, Georgia Mountain Convocation. And in the Anglican Communion, we pray for the new province of Alexandria, created from the former Diocese of Egypt with North Africa and the Horn of Africa in the Episcopal Church of Jerusalem and the Middle East. Lord, in your mercy. For the poor and suffering in the world and for those in need of our country and for our leaders on government on every level, that they might rise to the occasion of their need for the common good of all. Lord, in your mercy. For all who suffer in body, mind, our soul, for whom Christ is risen with healing in his glorious wings, that they may be comforted and especially for Helen, George, Jan, Louise, Fran, Janice, Marty, Ray, Laura, Jewel, Jean, Deacon Judith, Betty, Jack, Walton, Sarah, Jan, Dot, Jerry, Madison, Zane, Van, Don, Michaela, George, Jean, Jack, Dakota, Barbara, Jacob, Bill, Deacon Lucy, and Eno. Lord, in your mercy. For the weary and the sick and those who are consumed with sorrow, depression, and stress in these difficult times. For the victims of the virus, for those who tend them, for those who work to end the crisis. For those who have been affected in their livelihoods and security and sustenance. Lord, in your mercy. For all who have died in this difficult time, for all who grieve, that in Christ who triumphs over death, they may find life perpetual and blessed assurance. Lord, in your mercy, for those now in the armed services of our country and for their families, especially Joyce, David, Brandon, Maggie, Stephen, Austin, Mac, Lauren, Jacob, Gavin, Jake, Rose, Ash, Hunter, Derek, and Matt. Lord, in your mercy. For those who celebrate birthdays, especially Virginia Vaughn, Joseph Ford, and Jerry Jordan, and for all those who celebrate their wedding anniversaries. Lord, in your mercy. I invite your prayers at this time.
What new thing are you showing us in this time of the wilderness, dear Lord? What do you seek to teach us? Pray especially for all teachers as well, for all students, for all those engaged in the educational process, this holy process of, of cerebral and physical and emotional transformation. We give you thanks for those who are dedicated to this process. And we ask you to continue to inspire them. And for us to remember them and give thanks for them. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, your loving care for us calls for our gratitude. Multiply once again your abundant mercy towards us. Renew your promise towards us. And let our hearts overflow with godly love for others. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now let us pray in the words our Lord Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.